I said on Twitter and I said in previous streams, we need to treat the government budget like a household budget stuff will be used to attack them when they propose any kind of expenditure come the election. Just clip this, right? Save it. Post it on Twitter. The election will get fought on economic issues and Labour will look incompetent because they will have embedded the narrative around a household budget economics and the Tories will attack them on them in the run-up to the election. Mark my fucking words. When is the government going to step up and resolve the rail strikes? So the RMT have announced uh, this evening they have voted for more strikes to renew their strikes for possibly for a further six months. They could continue until November. And uh, according to the head of the RMT, that had overwhelming backing. According to the head of the RMT, they literally produced their ballot results yesterday. It was a 90% yes vote of a 54% turnout. It is not according to Mick Lynch. They just, do, they just have the mandate. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to strike. Okay. I thought you might come to me first. Well, look, when I became Transport Secretary, I thought it was helpful uh, to sit down with all of the leaders of the rail unions, at which I did, to try and uh, change the tone of the discussion. And I made sure that... After continuing to nix the discussions by what you have done, which is indemnifying the rail companies from any losses due to strike action, meaning that they have no financial needs to be able to get on the table and offer a good pay offer regardless, which is why, again, as mentioned on the last segment with Mark Harper involved, why they had to target the Eurovision Song Contest, because they need to get the government to the table by screwing up things that are good for the country. Um, which is unfortunate because it means that the government specifically are pushing the, the, the impact of the rail strikes onto the public as much as they possibly can, which is, you know, if people blame the government, which they should do, that's great, but they probably will just blame the unions. That They were able to be given fair and reasonable offers, and the network rail offer that went to the RMT's members was overwhelmingly supported, not my words, the RMT's words, 90% turnout, 76% in favour. Now, the vote that's taken place, that the result that's been declared today, is about renewing their strike mandate. It's actually the wrong question. What should have been put to the RMT's members is the offer that they have had from the uh, train operating companies, uh, which is, I think, a fair and reasonable offer. Uh, it's interesting how he says, oh, well, they did accept the deal from National Rail. When, yeah, the National Rail deal was a 14% pay rise and no compulsory redundancies. Yet you're now offering, asking them to accept the Rail Delivery Group settlement, which was 9% with compulsory redundancies. Do you think there might be a reason why one of them got accepted and one of them got denied, Mark? Are you, like, stupid or something? I mean, obviously, yes, he's a Tory. Of course he is. But there's an obvious reason why one of them got accepted and the other of them has been reballoted for strike action. It's almost like, off them a good pay offer, they'll stop striking. I think the RMT's members should be given the opportunity to look at the details of that deal and say whether they accept it or not. That's what they should be asked to do, rather than the RMT and ASLEF choosing to go on strike, specifically, cynically targeting the Eurovision Song Contest, which we're hosting for Ukraine. Uh, I just think that's the wrong thing to target. Uh, but the RMT be... members know what the offer is. They may not have been asked. They've never been asked what their opinion is. They've not been asked what their opinion is. Is this not them expressing their opinion by, no. by voting for further strike action? They have not action? been asked. Because if they like the look of it, they, they have, wouldn't vote well, for further strike action. They have not been asked. Uh, the deal that that's on the table has not been put to them. So it's so that gentle. Yeah, this is a crap deal. Why, why would they put it to the members when they know it's going to get voted down? Given, as Fiona Bruce amazingly managed to point out to him, they have already offered for strike action. If they didn't, if they didn't want to go on strike, if they, didn't, if they liked the deal, they wouldn't vote for strike action. It's not difficult, Mark. We'll ask, what are we doing? There is a deal on the table. I think, maybe this is slightly old-fashioned, the deal should be put to the members and they should be asked whether they want to accept it. When the network rail deal, which is broadly the same value, was put to the... No, 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 it's not broad. It's five point percentage points different. That's not broadly the same. That's nowhere near the same. You, like, dumb. Like, genuinely. RMT's members, it was overwhelmingly accepted, which I think suggests that the members thought it was a fair and reasonable offer in the circumstances. And by the way, they're going to put themselves out of work. The rail industry's finances at the moment are unsustainable. They're Apart from the £500 million they paid out to shareholders in 2022, we're forgetting about that tiny little detail, Mark. All of those shareholder dividends, maybe... Maybe. A lot of people are not using the railways post-pandemic. The numbers don't add up. I want a thriving, successful railway with good jobs 
for the people that work in the industry. That's only going to happen if we can encourage more people to use the railways, have a proper seven-day railway that operates uh, every day of the week. Okay, briefly. Uh, and I the think that's what's, is, that is what's required. When are you going to resolve it? Well, look, I when think can we expect well, the railways to be working normally? I think they should put the offer. There's a fair no, no, that's reasonable, I know you said there's that. There's a fair when, and reasonable when, offer. How long do you think this could go on for? There's a fair and reasonable offer on no, the you, table. You've made that point. They how should long put do it you to their members. Well, that's the they should put it to their members. So you can't say? They should, well, you have no idea. It, it can go the offer's been made by the train companies. The ball is in the RMT's court to put it to their members. David. Well, none of us want to see Eurovision disrupted... Um, FA. Of all the Labour MPs as well to be arguing a fucking David Lammy. Oh my god. If they got like a proper Labour MP who, who was an actual someone to come out of the union movement, they'd absolutely skewer him on this shit. But David Lammy is like ultra centrist. He, he's going to be crap at answering this, I bet you. 100%. Guarantee it. He's going to be rubbish. He's not going to point to anything of what I've just said. A cup disrupted. But I noticed that when Mark spoke, he said that when he came into the job, he got round with the unions. What we're hearing is that he hasn't done anything since. Um, and a negotiation means you've got to be in perpetual discussion. This is a strike that has now gone on for over a year. It means it's a failure on all sides, where you cannot come to a resolution after a year. So, of course, you've got to roll your sleeves up. You don't get to sit on the panel and pretend that you're a union boss. You're the Secretary of State. But there's you can't tell the them, table, David. You can't tell them how to... The point is they've rejected the deal. Get round no, the table with them. The discuss deal. with them. No, no, discuss with it. them. Meet them halfway. Understand that we're living in tough times. Pop Stop indemnifying the railways. Talk about the indemnification, David. It's the obvious point to make. What are you doing? Public sector workers are struggling, really struggling. They're going to food banks and other things. Meet them halfway and let's get rid of this strike. D David, train drivers get paid an average salary of £60,000. They're not going to food banks. They should put the offer that's on the table. No, but as, that's just as left. But the RMT staff, some of them are on as low as, you know, £20,000 a year. <laughs> to the members of the unions. But they, there is a fair and reasonable offer on the, the table. The RMT doesn't just, just they, represent no, train drivers. No, no, no. Drivers, but, 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 Aslef, lower paid but the RMT doesn't even represent any train drivers. That's entirely Aslev. RMT is everyone else. Oh, what's indemnification, Aircraft? Um, indemnification means that so the government has funds set aside so that any losses that the train companies are caused by the strike action they get reimbursed by the government so they're on so the, the train operating companies get who are franchised by the government do not suffer any financial losses during strike days so their incentive to resolve the strike action is removed by that as left is well. going on strike as well the point is there is an offer on the table and all i'm saying is i think that should be put to the members now if the members reject it then fine there will have to be some further discussions. But there is a fair and reasonable offer on the table. An equivalent offer was accepted uh, overwhelmingly by the RMT's okay. members that work for Network Rail. That's what I think. And David Lammy's not done the research to even know the difference between the two offers. That we're for one's 14%, one's 9%. Ah! Oh, God, fuck, he's so bad at this. He's so bad at this. It should happen next. The woman here. That's the second time in a week that you have said about the strikers letting Ukraine down. I think the government are letting Ukraine down. And as for them earning £60,000 a year and not going to food banks, how do you know that? How do you know they're not going to food banks? Well, I think if you're earning £60,000 a year, which is twice what the average... Oh, and again, we're not discussing fucking... We're discussing the actual RMT stuff. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Oh, they're, not, uh, they're not all earning no, 60 no, grand. No, no, train drivers. I was talking about train drivers. The average salary as a train driver is £60,000. The offer that's on the table that they haven't been asked about uh, would make that average salary £65,000 a year. Now, I don't think that is ungenerous, and I think they should be asked whether they want to accept the offer. The man in the black top at the side of the. Well, yes, exactly. You. Um, I think you've just got to put it into context. Like, nothing works. So it's not just the trains, is it? So for me, I have to go to London maybe once a month. In the last six months, I haven't managed to make it back without there being some disruption or some... Like, it's basically a train driver not wanting to turn up for a shift because it's just not worth it. The money's not there. But it, it, like, in the round, I'm three years into like, trying to get a court case. I'm 18 months trying to see a specialist. These strikes, they're the only people who can speak aloud for you to hear them. 
Minette. I think um, I'm sure everybody in this room has been massively disrupted um, by the strikes. They have gone on for well over a year. I can remember my 18-year-old son last year had booked concert tickets and we had this ghastly, is it going to happen, isn't it going to happen, and in the end it did happen and it was a complete nightmare and that has gone on and on and on. I'm completely with the Minister that why wouldn't you put it to the members? Put it to the members, if they vote against it, well fine, but if they accept it, they should, I'm sure, have a say. But for everything, whether it is the NHS, whether it is our trains, I've had three journeys this week where I've been standing for well over an hour, standing room only on a train, and it's, it's really, really difficult. So we, we desperately do need it resolved. Billy. I mean, as uh, David said, nobody wants to see uh, events disrupted, but the the reason why they're targeting uh, Eurovision and the FA Cup is because they're having to up the ante because the government is refusing to come to them and, and negotiate them with, with, a, with a proper payoff or with a payoff that they would like no, to... No, it's because they're indemnifying the railways. The, the, the franchisees are being indemnified by the government. That's why they have to go on the most impactful for the public, Billy. We literally have an entire panel of people who don't understand the dispute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lose my mind. So, unfortunately, the whole point of strike action um, is to cause disruption. And when you see who else is also on strike at the moment, uh, the, the RCN, uh, our teachers, I mean, these are absolute people who are fundamental to the running end of our society. And they deserve, in times when they feel that they're not getting proper remuneration, they have the right to go on strike and, and speak out. And, and as the gentleman up the back there said, you know, they're among the few people whose voices are heard where government ministers do have to pay attention to them, where everybody else who is suffering, or everybody else who's going to food banks, have to keep quiet. So they have my support. I hope it can get resolved. I'd love to see it get resolved before European, uh, before Euro Eurovision and uh, before the, the cup final. But, you know, no, people have a right to go on strike. People have a right to speak out, and I support them 100%. OK. Yes. Give me the if they're not taking your offer and you're saying that you've already given them one, why wouldn't you sit down and talk to them again? It's obvious that they don't want what you've offered them. Why wouldn't you give them more? Well, why? well, my question is that the union executive won't put it to their members. Now, look, if they put it to their members and the members reject it, then you might have a point. The, the members of the union, the people... That... What is another ballot for strike action other than a rejection of the deal? Come on. The executive is supposed to work for. They've not been asked their view. Okay. And when they had a similar offer with the uh, network rail offer, it was accepted overwhelmingly. So I said, put it to their members, ask their view. That's all I'm asking. Well, it's not. No one's asked them. You can't just assume that they don't want it. I said, put it to a democratic ballot and ask them what their view is. That doesn't seem enormously controversial. Peter. I I'm sure the minister will correct me if I have any of this wrong. It's been a while since I've looked at this dispute. But the first thing we have to recognise in, in all these pay disputes is to ask the question, who's doing the pushing? Whose conditions have been changed by whom? And everybody in this country who's, who's at work... And yeah, so the mandate for strike action was a 92% yes vote of a 54% turnout. So over half the members, by those maths, want to see more strike action, even if you take into account the turnout paid at the moment is being pushed by inflation and a rising cost of living. The wages which they had two years ago are not the wages they have now, they're worth considerably less. And under those circumstances, people who have the power to try and get back some of what they've lost from inflation can be expected to do so, and the railwaymen are among us. I wish the minister would stop referring to train drivers and what they're paid. Obviously, they are part of the dispute, but most of the people who are, who are taking part in it are not train drivers and they aren't paid anything like that. And it's silly of him to, to keep saying that because it, 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 it muddies the waters. I don't know how, the, how best you can compromise. My own view of, of British governments and the railways has been for many years that the, it's the government which is, is, causes far more disruption to my twice daily travel on the trains than any union has ever done. Uh, the, the, the failure to maintain uh, the ludicrous experiment of privatisation, which uh, largely wrecked the railways, the constant track circuit failures, signal failures, and other things, which and, 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 uh, currently I can't even get to work properly because a, a bridge has collapsed on my way to work. The, this is not a well-run, seriously... He's one of the most conservative journalists in the country, uh, Andreas, and yet even he understands that this is just a mass gigantic failure of policy. 
Like that, they, like genuinely, one of the most conservative journalists in the country, uh, and he's right. He's just correct. The invested service, and it's not taken seriously by the government, which runs a ministry for roads with railways tacked on. But I am not convinced that all justice in this is on the side of the government and the employers. And, I, and one of the reasons I'm not convinced of it is because people like the minister keep saying it's all about train drivers when it so patently isn't. People are facing, as I understand it, uh, the actual compulsory loss of jobs in no, South Africa. No, they're not. No, well, not nobody true. at all. That's, that's not gone, true. That's gone completely. There's no requirement for compulsory... There's no compulsory no, reduction but at that all. One of the things yeah. that's been offered by the employers is no... But no compulsory redundancies. And so that, and that's so when the union has said that, that there are going to be lots of job loss, that's simply not true. So we're not going to see, for instance, as, as, as I'm told, lots of, of, of ticket office staff disappearing in the coming years. No, the whole point so about... The, the, so five years from now, the whole, when I go to my local station, it'll be the same ticket office the whole, staff as right now. No, the whole point about the ticket office staff is uh, that only 12% only of people buy tickets now uh, from ticket offices. So hang on, so... We want the uh, ticket office staff yeah. out of the ticket offices in the stations properly able to support but so passengers. still have jobs, is that what Yes. It must have been a recent development then, because I was pretty sure that the no compulsory redundancies was only the national rail dispute and not the rail delivery group dispute. But they just won't be sat in a ticket office oh. not selling tickets to people. Most tickets are now sold online or from machines. People do not buy tickets from ticket offices. It's not how people do it anymore. Well, uh, you're, you're looking at someone who bought a ticket this morning at a ticket office. But you're one so, of the 12%, sorry, you're wrong. Peter. I mean, 90%, lots of people, no, but I'm, I'm, most people I'm, do not. Lots of people prefer it, but I, it's just it's part of the issue. Older people and disabled people are the main people who use it. I, but but I, I think that it, it, if, if you would just perhaps be, uh, be, have been more concerned about running and, and creating and maintaining a decent railway service uh, for the past 50 years, instead of trying to privatise it and shut it down and, and squeeze it in favour of roads, then I might take more seriously your concern for railway passengers. At the moment, I'm a little doubtful. OK. Let's take another question. Couldn't say fairer than From that. Mick Murphy, where are you? With Keir Starmer reneging on his commitment to abolish tuition fees, why should anyone trust any of the Labour Party's policies? True. True and based. David, obviously you want to ask this. I'm going to come to you in a minute. Um, Billy. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very disappointing. I mean, I'm a Labour Party member and I voted for Starmer in the election on the pledges that he made. And so far, um, he seems to have rode back from almost all of them. Um, you know, I wasn't really expecting just continuity Corbyn. I was expecting the, the best aspects of what Corbyn and particularly John McDonald had put forward to come in to inform Labour policy. But it seems since then that uh, he's been, uh, you know, rowing back towards the centre ground. And I don't know what the thinking behind that. I mean, see, it seems really foolish to have this argument just a couple of days before the local elections to give everybody the opportunity to have this debate as it has been in the newspapers. I don't really understand the, the thinking behind that, but I think um, it's absolutely key that the, the Labour Party doesn't take for granted the, the huge leads it's been getting in, in opinion polls. I don't think those, those kind of things aren't going to, you know, the election may be sometime later next year. I'm not sure that those kind of numbers are going to last that long. And if it comes down to personalities, which unfortunately uh, politics does these days. I think we, a lot of people still aren't sure who Keir Starmer is and what he stands for. And, and I think that's... This is a garbage answer, by the way. The correct way to answer this question is to say, the reason why I stood about those pledges, a lot of those pledges were around an economic model of the country, which is supported by the vast majority of people. You just heard Peter Hitchens talk about um, how bad the privatisation of the railways are. So is the bad. So what's also bad is the privatisation of water, energy, and mail, and of course, rail, as was mentioned, right? These are all positions with which the vast majority of the electorate agree with. It is, quite frankly, nonsense politics to row back from these pledges when these are not hallmarks of far-left Corbynism. These are, these are positions held by a supermajority of members of the public, including Conservative members. So not only is it a betrayal of the people who elected him, not only is it counter to the desires of the Labour Party membership, but it is also counter to the desires of the general public as well. That's going to be a real problem for the party. And it sounds like you're not sure what he stands for. Will he, will he get your vote? Well, where I live uh, in West Dorset, a tactical vote is the best way to uh, get a change of government. 
So that's so something no. I'm going to have to consider uh, when so the time So he might comes. not get your vote then. Well, he might not. No, as I say, tactile voting, I think, in, in a, uh, an electoral system like ours, uh, which is first past the post, winner takes all. If you really want your vote to have some meaning, you have to think okay. very hard about voting tactically. So, as I've done in the past, I may do that again. Mark? Well, there's two things. There's the view about Keir Starmer and his flip-flopping on issues, and then the second one is the substance of, of the issue. So, I mean, on the, on the promises thing, he is all over the place on lots of things, and people will have to take a view about whether they can believe what he says and he'll say things before an election and they'll have to worry about whether he sticks to it afterwards and I mean, you know whether he gets pushed around well, as I'm, as I'm sure you're aware i mean for example he 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 pledged to charge people 10 pounds for missing a gp appointment he then changed his mind about pretty sharpish he wanted to allow fracking with local consent. He's now banned it. I mean, there's a, there's a list of things that Rishi Sunak has changed his mind on as but well. He'll, he'll, be, he'll have been Prime Minister for a big period before the election, and people will better look at what he's delivered, and they'll be able to make a... I think it's reasonable as well in that um, Rishi Sunak was going to be Prime Minister after making these pledges, right? So that's kind of the direction of travel, really, for him to go have a manifesto ahead for a future election. Right? Until he stands on a manifesto as Prime Minister, he can't really implement those policies immediately, even if he fundamentally believes in them. But Keir Starmer is saying, when it comes to the next general election, my manifesto will not include these pledges. Now, that's a different thing entirely. Although, obviously, Richard Sinek is indeed a liar who doesn't who will say anything to get elected as well. And I'm sure that when it comes to um, the next manifesto, Richie Sinek probably will leave out things like £10 GP appointments and these... Um, electorally unviable things will have been missed out and we can make the same criticisms of Rishi Sunak that we're making of Keir Starmer now. I do not doubt that we'll have something reasonably similar uh, at that point. But it's an easy attack line. The Tories can make this attack line forever because it's true. He has gone back on every single pledge that he made to become leader uh, and the, if the Tories want to attack him as a person make it down to personality because it won't be on policy because the policies are identical at this point then they're going to have a really easy job of convincing the general public that Keir Starmer is not to be trusted. ...judgment about it, right? So I, I think I'd be very content, uh, as I did last summer, you know, pushing my arguments in favour of the Prime Minister based on his record. On the tuition fee substance point, uh, I very strongly support them for this reason. I, I come from a working-class background. If you look at Scotland, where they don't have uh, charged people tuition fees... Oh, yes, I come from a working-class background. Oh, yes, that's me. Don't sound it, mate. If you're a working class kid in Scotland, you've got much less chance of going to university and having the opportunity of higher education than if you come from the same family in England. I want to make sure that as many young people as possible who want to uh, can go to university to have the opportunities. And actually, a system that we have now is one way of maximising that compared to not having it. So I fully support the policy, but I do think the flip-flopping is going to be a problem. Actually, what maximised it was going to £3,500, the original tuition fees with the original loan repayment scheme. That was the best way of getting working class people to university because universities wanted to make the money, so they, they lowered their entry requirements to have a bigger intake, so more working class people got the opportunity because they were less selective. Um, and the fees weren't too big and the loans were repayable because they were only put up by RPI. But now the loans put up by RPI plus 3% and then £9,500. So working class people do actually literally get debt trapped by the new student loan system where they didn't before under the £3,000 costs, whilst also the same amount of places are available. If you look at the statistics, the amount of working class kids who went to university way in continued increasing after the £3,500 fees, but dropped after the £9,000 fees and the change of loan repayments. So the, actually the sweet spot is the £3,000 mark with the fair loans. And for the Labour Party in Keir Starmer. So David, first of all, your answer to the question, why should anyone trust any of the Labour Party's policies? And particularly what Billy had to say, he was a lifelong Labour supporter, but is, is, is not at all impressed by what Keir Starmer has done, particularly on this. Well, look, it's clear to me that the current system isn't working for students. It's not working for universities, it's not working for employers, and we do need to change it. Keir Starmer did make commitments. He made them a few years ago, before the pandemic, before the problems we've had in our economy as a result of Ukraine and a result of Liz Trust and Kwasi Kwarteng. And there are two kinds of leaders you can have. You can have an ideological leader also, neither of these things precludes you from making for taking away tuition fees or even dropping tuition fees, right? Down to previous levels and changing the loan repayment scheme. Nothing, none of this can, is necessarily 
something that you are precluded from doing because of the changes in the economy post-Covid, post-Ukraine, post-Trust? That pursues a budget despite everyone warning her against it and virtually bankrupts the country and certainly drives our more... You can't bankrupt the country, you have a central bank. Which is up, you can have that kind of leader. And if you want Keir Starmer to be that kind of leader, maybe he should stick to the fees. Or you can have a pragmatic leader that looks at the budget that he's got, recognises that we want to do something about childcare in this country, we want free school meals for kids, climate change in our big pledge, and we've got to be able... Ah, oh, yes, a famous working-class chartered accountant at Oxford, of course. ...able to afford it. But hang on, hang on, Dick. Students, no, hang on, Dick. One it batch depends. of students scrapping fees would cost £9.5 So, yes, we want change, and we'll set that out before the election, but I want someone who's pragmatic and hard-headed, not an ideologue. Vote Tory if you want that. The thing is, he is an ideologue. He's a neoliberal ideologue. He's a centrist ideologue. Like, the idea that you can be not, you can be non-ideological in the way that you approach policy prescriptions is nonsense. Like, this is what liberals and centrists always do, where everyone outside of their political bubble is, an ideo is ideological, and you're just pragmatic because you believe, because you're doing centrist things. That's an ideology. You are, you are supplanting, right, genuine positions for, an ide for ideological centrism. Right? You cannot make policy without, inf without it being informed by your own ideology. This is nonsense. So, pure ideology. So, Keir Starmer made 10 pledges during his leadership campaign. And, and as you say, you want something pragmatic, you could recognise the state of the economy. But when it comes to, to supporting nationalisation of rail, mail, energy and water, they were always going to be hugely expensive, whatever state the economy was in. But that's but what revenue generators he pledged to do, and he's now rode back on all of it. Look, we're committed on rail. But you look at the envelope you've got and you present to the country, I think, a fiscally costed plan. And that is what the public expect us to do at the next election. And that is what we will do. And look, you know, for me, being in politics to change people's lives has to be about power, not about sitting at a university um, and studying politics or the theory of politics. So look, we've got to be clear that we can cost what we put to the country, and Keir Starmer is absolutely adamant of that. And that's why I was pleased to co-chair his campaign to lead our party and to support him now. All right, let's hear a bit from our audience here. Yes, this is a nonsense again, like household budget economics. It will come back and bite them in the arse. I said on Twitter and I said in previous streams, this, all this, we need to treat the government budget like a household budget stuff will be used to attack them when they propose any kind of expenditure come the election. Don't you you clip this right? Save it, post it on Twitter. As I will say, make my stake now: the election will get fought on economic issues, and Labour will look incompetent because they will have embedded the narrative around a household budget economics, and the Tories will attack them on them in the run up to the election. Mark my fucking words. Woman there in the, in the glasses. Hi, um, I feel very strongly that until political mandates are made legally binding, every party does what they want to do. They back out of what they've said they're going to do, and it's across the, every single party. I think we're putting politicians in a really difficult position where actually if they're saying one thing and they recognise that they can't do it anymore, they're no longer allowed to say, I can't do it. So I don't really understand what expectation we're giving them when even if they understand they have to be honest, we're not allowing them to be. And I feel like that's what's happened in this situation. So when you see... Uh, apart from literally all of the pledges have gone, all of them, there's nothing left apart from climate maybe. It's like So one out of ten pledges is, is continually being put forward by the Labour leader. Like what, At what point are they allowed to just completely change all of their opinions between being elected as leader and standing at a general election, right? They have to change minds on some things, but they can't, changing their entire policy prescription mandate three years after being elected leader, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, I mean, you had the woman there saying, you know, what's the point of pledges? That they, they, you know, they might stick to them, they might not. As far as you're concerned then, if, if, the, if, if a prospective leader makes a pledge <coughs> as part of their election campaign, I think it's, it's a wish list rather than a pledge. And I think, well, and I think the fact that they've made that pledge before people have gone to the polls to exactly. decide whether they should be leader is the honourable thing to do. I think had people gone to the polls, voted for them, and then they backtracked, then I think there's a different question to be asked. But the fact they came out with it and said it openly and honestly 
actually is something to be admir uh, admired. Okay, Peter. Well, I agree with Wrong. that. It's perfectly sensible for a leader of a party to pull out of a pledge before the election. He's obviously haunted by what happened to li the Liberal Democrats and Nick Clegg when they made the pledge, went into the election and then backtracked. So you can't blame him for that. I think what really needs to be examined in this country is the unaffordability of the crazy university expansion program, uh, which was begun by John Major and then accelerated by the Blair preacher uh, into a, a ridiculous uh, raising of the national school leading age uh, to 21. Uh, and the, the creation of huge numbers of, of new universities and the propelling of people into university courses, which in many cases aren't doing them any good. Uh, the, we, what we don't have in this... I mean, Fred is, I mean it's Christovich and brothers, so that makes sense. ...country is what they have in Germany, which is a serious attempt to, to, to create large numbers of, of apprenticeships. Uh, we don't train people to do, to do the work which needs to be done. We don't train the sort of people we need for the sort of economy we need at all. We just have huge numbers of students saddled with gigantic debts uh, for many, many years to come uh, with, with qualifications they can't, in many cases, use. It's been a mistake. The time has come to recognise... I mean, you'd think that given the change of... Um, given the change of... Uh, the move towards a service technology-based economy, you'd think you'd want more people with degrees, you know, more people with... If you're looking at this purely from an economic standpoint rather than a holistic standpoint, you'd think that, OK, we need more people who are computer programmers, more people who do... Um, uh, are going to be there for AI or to be you know, doing design for whatever new particular piece of uh, electronic um, labour-saving device is going to become the big thing moving forward, right? Truly, that's what you want. We don't need people getting apprenticeships to go into manufacturing because we don't have any manufacturing anymore. That, that got gutted by continual uh, neoliberal administrations. That. It's that's going to shrink the universities, reduce the number of students, and those who do go to university should be treated as I was when I went to university. They should get a full grant for maintenance and they should not pay fees. And, that, and the nation should invest in those people who can get benefit from university and it should invest in people who can get benefit from other forms of life in other ways. The experiment has failed. It's time we abandon it. And if people would... It, this is another thing about modern politics. Uh, we say we want politicians who think and who change their minds. When a politician changes his mind, he's accused of a U-turn and mocked. Uh, when, a, when, when a politician uh, actually thinks out loud in public and says anything original, he's accused of making a gaffe and is surrounded by people on social media howling at him or her for what they've said. We actually need, if we want proper politics in this country, to have people allowed to think and allowed to change their minds. OK. I agree with what the gentleman said, but I do think that um, I kind of like, I'm, I'm an undecided voter next election, and I would like someone who keeps the promises. And I think regardless whether you're Conservative, <laughs> Labour, Lib Dem, whatever, it would be a nice surprise for quite a lot of the uh, electorate, I think, if we had a politician who actually kept the manifesto and unfortunately didn't lie or, or lead the truth, because I think that's, that would gain a lot of support from people like me for sure okay and also there's also a difference in the fact that at no point did Keir Starmer actually ever want to implement any of these policies because it wasn't being done to um as a view to change the country it wasn't being done because he, he, he wanted to do it but now he's reneging it for pragmatic reasons no these were things lies that he told to win over the membership that he was going to renege that he had already plans to renege on later this is what this literally what was told to margaret hodge during the leadership election that they had no intention of honoring a bunch of these pledges anyway and they were just told to lie to membership because membership don't deserve to have the truth told to them again because he is indeed a snake he is a liar he is deceitful it's as simple as that so, Minette, the question is, with Keir Starmer reneging on his commitment to abolish tuition fees, why should anyone trust any of the Labour Party's policies? Well, I've worked with three different Prime Ministers in the last 12 months, and they've all, from the same party, had different priorities. So it happens. I think you've only got to look at the national debt now, leaving the EU, global pandemic, war in Ukraine, a national debt the size that we have. It is simply unaffordable right now. Wrong!
not how an economy works. Shut up. You learn macroeconomics. We had similar levels of debt to GDP ratio at the end of the Second World War. Did we stop spending just because we had our public debt was high? No, of course we fucking didn't. We had the biggest amount of state investment into our economy that we basically ever had in this country in the post-war period. It gave us loads of growth. We grew out of our of our of our government debt rather than austeritying our way um, uh, by removing budget deficits, for example. This is how you deal with a large budget debt, with large national debts on war expenditure, which is what COVID was. COVID was war expenditure in that we were, had a, we were running on a war economy. So it's going to take a post-war government to be able to fix the economy. Now, what we need to see is a really clear policy framework for young people right the way through primary, secondary, into the workplace. Apprenticeship levy being wasted in many cases right now. That could work much better. We need, I think, a radical rethink for the young people in this country as to what the policy framework is going to look like, and then politicians, as you say, need to stick to it. OK. Let's move on. I'm going to try and get through quite a few questions this evening, if I can. We've got a... I love how she's like, no one even brought up the idea. Everyone just agrees a country can, with a sovereign central bank can go bankrupt. No, that's not a thing that happens. You can't, that, doesn't, that literally doesn't exist. That's nonsense. It's complete fiction. Uh, and apparently everyone just, and no one's going to point out that it was just all lies, it was deliberate lies as well. But I guess, you know, internally with party politics, a bit of a niche thing.